it's about time for Molly to show up. I glance at the clock and hurriedly stalk the bread into shelf. I'm Amy, running a bakery in a small town in Nebraska. I moved here five years ago and finally opened my own bakery. Well, I share the business with my mother. My parents ran a bakery in New York City's old neighborhood. After high school, I mastered baking and worked in the family business. After my dad passed, mom and I relocated here to open a new bakery. We loved this nature-rich town and talked about moving here someday. Talking like that, we often visited new places on our days off. We found a perfect spot for our bakery and made a quick call to the realtor. A few months later, we moved and started the bakery. Yes, we're ready. Can't wait for tomorrow's opening, huh? I bet Dad's proud of us. On the first day, there was a line of customers outside. Welcome. Oh, what delicious-looking bread. And what a scent. It's made with sourdough. Really? Local wheat? Please try many kinds. The bread in our shop features a chewy texture that brings out the natural sweetness of the wheat. It is our home recipe passed down from my father's commitment to using natural yeast and carefully selected ingredients. Business steadily grew, with repeat customers increasing day by day. Then, suddenly, a tragedy struck. My mother passed away unexpectedly from a heart attack. She went to bed one night and never woke up again. She never opened her eyes again. I have been taking care of the bakery alone ever since. One day, the door opens, and a little girl walks in. Hi, Amy. Molly, have some fried bread ends with sugar today. Yay, I love those. When I took a bag of bread from the back table and handed it to Molly, she said, Just a bit. And took one out of the bag and ate it in one bite. Yummy, thank you. See you tomorrow. You bet, have a great day. Molly waved goodbye with a smile and left. It's been a year since Molly started coming to the shop every morning. That day, it was raining from the morning. As usual, I was getting ready for the opening by arranging freshly baked bread on the shelves. I see a young girl peeking inside my shop, without umbrella. I open the door and invite her in. Shop opens at 8. Where's your umbrella? Come inside. The little girl hesitated, turned toward me, and spoke in a soft voice. Do you have end pieces of bread? The end pieces of the bread? Yes, I heard you can get them for free at the bakery. The little girl looked down, seemingly embarrassed. Her mother must use them for cooking? I thought, we do have some, go ahead and take them. I said, putting the end pieces of the bread into a bag and handing it to the girl. Thank you. I give her a bag of bread heels and she leaves happily. Starting from that day, every morning at 7.50, a little girl named Molly would come by the bakery to pick up some bread heels. One day, curiosity got the better of me and I asked her, Hey Molly, what does your mom do with these bread ends? Does she make some sort of dish or use them for something else? Um, well, it's a secret. She mumbled, looking down as if she didn't want to talk about it. Despite my various questions over time, she seemed reluctant to share personal details. All I knew about her was her name, Molly, and that she was in first grade. While I knew little about her personal life, she would chat about her day at school. Guess what? Yesterday I drew a picture of my friend Rich and a giraffe. The teacher said we did a good job. Oh wow, I want you to draw it next time. Sure, I will. I always looked forward to these brief morning encounters with the smiling and adorable Molly. However, one day she came into the shop with a gloomy expression, unlike her usual self. Good morning, Amy. Morning. Hey, you don't seem yourself today. Are you not feeling well? I asked her since I was concerned that she might be sick, but she said, No, it's not that. She continued to look down, avoiding eye contact. What could be wrong? This was unlike her. Then, lifting her face towards me, she said, You see, I won't be coming here starting tomorrow. So, today is the last day for the bread ends. Oh, really? That's a surprise. I responded with a slightly surprised tone. Is she moving away? I'll miss you. Yay, I'm gonna miss you too. Tears appeared in her eyes. I softly patted her little head, telling her to come by anytime. Several months passed. One day while out shopping in town, I spotted a familiar little girl. Could it be? Molly? I recognized that yellow dress. And although her hair had grown, it was unmistakably her. I ran over to her. Molly. Oh, Amy. She seemed to recognize me instantly. Long time no see. I said, prompting her to suddenly break down into tears right there. 
What's wrong, Molly? She continued to cry, refusing to speak. Something was definitely wrong. I took her hand and led her to a nearby family diner to hear her out. Once we were seated, she began to calm down. Have you had lunch yet? You can order whatever you like. As I spread the menu on the table, her stomach growled audibly. Really? Can I eat anything I want? Her eyes, recently cleared of tears, widened as she scanned the menu. Finally, she said, Amy, I want this. Pointing at a kid's lunch that came with a melon soda and gave me a big, happy smile. I placed the order with the waitress, and our food arrived shortly after. Wow, this shrimp is delicious, and the fried chicken is so tender. The little girl enthusiastically picked up the food with her fork, grinning and declaring how tasty it was with every bite. Before long, she had polished off her kid's meal and seemed quite content. I'm stuffed, she said, and after a pause, started to open up. You know, I used to go get the crusts of bread every day. That was my meal. Your mom used to make all sorts of things for you, right? I asked, curious what kind of dish or dessert it was. Nah, just eating it plain. Sometimes toasted, but I never got tired because it was so good. Really? Every day? I was listening in disbelief. See, my mom works late nights and sleeps during the day, so she doesn't have time to cook for me. She told me that if I go to the bakery, I could get a lot of tasty bread crusts for free. She said with a small smile. She also taught me to take some leftover side dishes put out in front of the local deli after it closes. I go there and secretly take a bag home. I was speechless. This was too much. According to young Molly, she was once told by her mother to go to her grandmother's house alone, given a small amount of money. Her mother disappeared after that, never to return. Molly ended up living at her grandma's until an unfortunate accident landed her grandma in the hospital. With no other relatives to rely on, she confided in a school teacher, which eventually led her to a care facility. From then on, she's been commuting to school from that facility. As she explained this, she broke down crying. I too could not hold back my tears. Molly, you've been through so much. From now on, let's live together. I found myself saying, my bakery opens early but closes in the afternoon, so we can spend evenings together. And you can come play in the shop during the day whenever you like. I had been running my bakery for five years and was financially stable. I felt I could support a young girl. Really? Are you sure? Her teary, red eyes widened in surprise. She said firmly. Yes, I want to live with you. I went to the care facility and expressed my intention to adopt her. Although it took some time for paperwork and evaluations, we were eventually able to welcome her into our home. From that day on, Molly became my daughter. I now have new member in my family. Ah, uh, I've got an idea. She clapped her hands in excitement. How about mixing the dough with a paste of homegrown basil and tomato for the summer season, Mom? That sounds fabulous. Molly, no longer a child, graduated high school without issue and now attends a culinary school to become a baker. She's even working in the shop with us. Hey, let's try making that with my homemade sourdough starter. What a great idea. Let's do it. A friend who used to work with me at a bakery during my apprentice days suggested he had become a reliable partner, often coming by the shop to help out, and now he lives with us. The weather is really nice today, isn't it? One busy day, I looked up and saw a beautiful blue sky through the window. For a moment, I felt as if my parents were watching us from the other side, smiling. Mom, Dad, I found this wonderful family. Please keep watching over us. Just then, the sun seemed to glitter between the gaps in the clouds, as if cheering my farts. I lost my parents in an accident when I was young and was raised in an orphanage. Kids can be cruel. In school, I was often bullied simply because I grew up in an orphanage. Friends would often say, I feel sorry for you, Catherine. Yes, I was indeed raised in an orphanage after losing my parents, but I never felt unfortunate. The staff at the orphanage were all very caring, and I got along with the other kids like they were my siblings. So, I was fed up with the pity and the bullying. After graduating high school, I started working at a small company in a rural town. Only the CEO and the vice president knew about my upbringing. My colleagues accepted me, and I made some good friends. I felt like I could build a new life in this town. I wouldn't face any more prejudice. 
But one day, that all changed. Hey, the money from the safe is gone. The loud voice came from the vice president just as I arrived at work. He wasn't a popular figure. He'd nitpick over small errors and never took responsibility when things went wrong. I just rolled my eyes thinking, He's making a fuss again. But if the money really was stolen, that's a big deal. While I was pondering the situation, for some reason, the vice president shot me a glare. He then stormed over, staring me down like a demon. Seeing my reaction, the vice president furrowed his brow and slowly approached me. Catherine, it was you, wasn't it? What? What did I do? I'm saying you stole the money. He claimed I took the money from the safe while working late the previous evening. Yes, I did work late, but I had no access to the safe's combination. I tried to deny the accusations, but he just sneered at me. This is why I don't trust orphanage kids. Don't lie. Fife like you have no place in this company. You're fired. Get out now, and I'm calling the police. His words left me in shock, though I barely heard it. I think Monica, his wife and the company secretary, tried to defend me. The vice president yelling, Give back the money, was absolutely terrifying. And revealing my past in front of my colleagues was too much. I felt dizzy and mumbled a quick farewell before fleeing the office. This town is a small coastal village. As I drove home along the shoreline, tears streamed down my face. I'd never steal, even if I was raised in an orphanage. The staff taught me well. I know right from wrong and that lying is bad. Yet the vice president suspected me of theft just because I was raised in an orphanage. All because I was simply unlucky, losing my parents when I was young. Why do I have to go through this just for that? I can't stay in this town anymore. I love this coastal town, but it seems I have to say goodbye. I returned to my apartment room and spent my time gazing out at the ocean occasionally drifting to sleep from exhaustion. While I was lost in thought, the doorbell rang, dragging my heavy body. I opened the door. I found my colleague and friend, Tiffany, holding a shopping bag and smiling. Let's go out for a drink. The moon looks beautiful tonight. Tiffany is always so upbeat and supportive. The thought of leaving the town and not seeing Tiffany again made me emotional as we headed out. We sat on the seawall and opened a beer can. With a satisfying, uh, Tiffany took a sip of her beer and began telling me what happened today after I left. The vice president seemed to have assumed that, being raised in an orphanage and presumably lacking common sense and money, I must be the culprit. However, my colleagues defended me, saying, Catherine would never do such a thing. Monica, the VP's wife, apparently tried to calm the VP down. After I was driven out, the CEO came into work and, after hearing an overview from the VP, reprimanded him for firing Catherine without consulting him. However, even the CEO doesn't know who opened the safe and took the money. He mentioned that there are only a few people who have access to the company, and while he wouldn't jump to conclusions about it being me, he thinks there's a high likelihood it's one of the employees. The VP and the CEO couldn't decide whether to involve the police, and that's how the day ended. The whole company feels like they're on a manhunt, and it's super uncomfortable. When I told the boss I was going to see Catherine, he passed on a message saying, I'm truly sorry. Take some paid time off and rest. I don't think we need to keep working in such an environment. I'm also considering quitting if this atmosphere continues. Tiffany said all this in her usual carefree manner. Gathering courage, I asked something I had long wondered. Did you feel sorry or disgusted knowing I grew up in an orphanage? She replied, Why would I? Whether you grew up in an orphanage or with a family, the Catherine I know now is what matters to me. You're hardworking, sincere, sensitive, and surprisingly can hold your liquor really well. Hearing her words, I couldn't help but shed tears. She laughed and said, Why are you crying? But her comforting hand on my back told me everything. There are people who see me as just Catherine, not orphanage race Catherine. That made me happy and gave me peace. A week has passed and Stephanie and I drank beer by the sea. I was on the hunt for a new job. The thought of possibly never seeing my colleagues again saddened me, but one has to work to live. Just as I was thinking about getting ready to move at a moment's notice, my smartphone rang. Company name that was displayed sent my heart racing. Worried it might be the vice president, but summoning my courage. I answered to find it was the CEO on the line. Catherine, I'm glad you picked up. We've identified the real culprit and I'd like you to come to the office. You don't have to if it's too hard." He assured me, but having been suspected of theft, I wanted to know who the real thief was. 
I'll be there. I replied, and after a week's absence, I showed up at the office. Upon my arrival, my colleagues rushed over, asking with concern, are you okay? And we were so worried. Grateful for my supportive colleagues, I reassured each one with, I'm fine. As I did, I noticed the CEO motioning for me from the back of the office. After expressing my gratitude to my colleagues, I headed back to where the CEO was. Seated on a sofa were the vice president and his wife, Monica. While the vice president looked upset, Monica's face was ashen. She trembled visibly. Monica, her face so pale it went beyond blue, was shaking, her hands trembling on her lap. Before I could process the situation, the vice president froze and started apologizing. Catherine, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me for making baseless assumptions about your background and thinking you were the thief. I was caught off guard by the sudden apology. I looked at the CEO for explanation. He explained with a weary expression. The real thief, he began wearily, was Monica. Hearing this, Monica squeezed her eyes shut as if to escape the reality. The CEO then shared the series of events leading up to this discovery. The vice president had been adamant that I was the culprit. He'd apparently tried to call me multiple times to demand the money back. But all along, Monica had been desperately trying to stop him. Even when he wanted to report the theft to the police, Monica vehemently objected. Even when the CEO asked the other employees, they all reportedly said, We can't believe that she did it. We should report it to the police. With the staff's unanimous support and going against the wishes of Monica, who held a strong position as the VP's wife, the CEO was about to file a report when Monica finally confessed. It was me. Monica had an obsession with designer brands. Naturally, amassing such luxury items required significant amount of money. Keeping it a secret from her husband, she had accumulated debts buying these items, and the debts grew steadily. Ultimately, overwhelmed by her financial situation, Monica impulsively took money from the company safe. It seems she intended to return the money to the safe before anyone noticed, but by chance, when the vice president opened the safe, it was discovered that the money was missing. When the vice president pegged me as the culprit, Monica hoped that things would settle down with me taking the blame. However, with the backing of the other employees and just as they were about to report to the police, she confessed out of fear her crime would be discovered. I'm truly, truly sorry. Monica's voice was frail and defeated as she apologized. It's not like I didn't feel anger towards her, but seeing her in such a devastated state, I couldn't bring myself to yell at her. I can't forgive you for trying to pin the crime on me. Nor can I forgive the vice president for looking down on my upbringing. But now, I'm just so stunned I don't have words. When I express my honest feelings, both the vice president and Monica shrank back their shoulders slumping. The CEO apologized to me once again, saying, I'm truly sorry. Catherine wasn't the culprit. The vice president's decision to suspect you from the start was absolutely wrong. I'll make sure nothing like this happens again in the future. As for Monica, I had to let her go. The staff value Catherine's hard work and they've said that without you, the work doesn't get done. I'm truly grateful for the dedication you've shown. I know it's a lot to ask, but would you consider coming back to our company? Honestly, I felt reluctant about working with the vice president who accused me of being the culprit, belittled me for being raised in an orphanage, and even went as far as forcing me to resign. However, I'm truly grateful to the CEO who warmly welcomed me, even though I was just a high school graduate with no particular skills, saying, A sincere person will grow over time. Moreover, the desire to work alongside my colleagues, who knew about my upbringing but never doubted me and always stood by my side, felt much stronger to me. If you wish for me to return, then I'd be more than happy to work for this company again. The CEO, with a beaming smile, thanked me saying, Thank you. The vice president continued to apologize to me multiple times afterward. Monica, shaking, kept repeating, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But I brushed it off, saying, it's okay now. Although I was upset, there was no point in staying angry forever. After all, Monica had been fired. She'd already face consequences. I decided to calm my anger. A few days later, the vice president and Monica came to my house with a box of pastries to apologize again. Monica became a stay-at-home wife and apparently stopped her extravagant shopping sprees. 
The vice president and Monica didn't have any children, and the vice president reflected, saying, Maybe I was too engrossed in my work and made my wife feel lonely. He started coming home right on time every day. To finish work on time, there's no room to constantly nitpick every minor mistake made by the team. The vice president became more efficient in his work, and company operations became smoother than before. You could say the work environment became more pleasant. From then on, no incidents like theft occurred, and my ordinary days returned. Sipping beer at the seawall, I said to Tiffany, Thank you. All of us, including me, just recognized your hard work, she replied with a smile. Growing up in an institution, I faced a lot of hardships, but Tiffany and my colleagues taught me that your daily efforts are always noticed by those around you. Having experienced that firsthand, I continue to approach my work sincerely, looking forward to my evening beer. Married for eight years. No kids, but still, I've been living a happy and peaceful life. My family has been landowners for generations. For the past few years, my mother has been living alone, but it was her death that revealed the hidden nature of my husband, Andy. He had been plotting something terrible behind my back. This is a story of unveiling such a husband's true nature and seeking revenge. Don't worry, she hasn't noticed a thing. Just a little longer and this mansion will be ours. I'll sell it off after living here for a bit, and then I'll dump her too. My name is Emily. Andy and I have been married for eight years. We originally worked at the same bank where he was my mentor, which is how our relationship began. After several years of dating, we're now living in an apartment near my childhood home. Not to brag, but my family home is quite a mansion. Andy was quite surprised by its size when he came over to meet my parents. My family has been landowners for generations. We have a substantial amount of land, and since there were many in the family, we had several outbuildings separate from our main living quarters. The number and size of the rooms were incomparable to other houses. During my father's time, it was just the three of us living there, my parents and me. But my father passed away a few years ago, and now my mother, Jessica, lives alone. As the years go by, her legs have been getting weaker, and she says, It's good exercise for me. But moving around the house and in her room has obviously become a burden for her. So after discussing it with her, I decided to get a caretaker to help her out. The lady who comes over now is a lovely person, and I hit it off with her right away. My mother was also happy, saying she finally has a friend she can chat to. That's why we've put our trust in the caretaker. On weekends, I tend to go to my parents' home with Andy. Andy is so likable and kind that he quickly became a favorite of my mother. Jessica, I'll change this light bulb for you. Oh, you shouldn't have. Not at all. I'm glad to be of help. I'm always doing stuff like this at my own place too. Andy said that as he skillfully took care of the task. He also enthusiastically took on chores like fixing the storm shutters, which can be challenging for women. When I'm too busy to visit home, Andy sometimes goes there by himself. In this way, the relationship between Andy and my mother has been great. However, on the other hand, my relationship with my in-laws was never a good one. We had trouble conceiving children. My in-laws would often press us with questions like, Not yet. Again. And to be honest, I was fed up with it. When will I be able to cuddle my sin's child? Well, as much as you say that, this is something we can't just make happen. Perhaps they didn't like my attitude because they started making my life difficult every time we met. I decided this was too much and consulted with Andy about it. I was internally worried that Andy might side with his parents, yet to my relief he didn't, opting instead to join my anger and confront them directly. Mom, you should stop saying things like that. This is a matter between husband and wife. But the in-laws didn't change their behavior towards me at all. So Andy took it into consideration and managed things so that I wouldn't have to deal with his parents from then on. Everything okay with them, Andy? I've talked to them, so it's all good. I get where they're coming from, but that was definitely an overstep. You're under my wing, so don't worry. Since Andy took care of all the essential communications, I was finally able to have a peaceful life. And yet, one day, while I was at work, I got a call from Andy. It turned out my mother had collapsed. So I rushed to my parents' home. The doctor explained that her chronic illness had worsened and there was no hope for recovery. Hearing that, I felt desperate. There were so many conversations I still wanted to have with her, so many places I wanted to go, so many things I wanted to do for her. 
Thinking about it, I couldn't stop the tears. Andy stayed by my side through it all. I was so grateful to have married him. I truly thought so from the bottom of my heart. Then, a few weeks after she was hospitalized, my mother passed away quietly. Mom. As I remembered everything up to now, all that came to mind were regrets. But even then, it was Andy who cheered me up. Always close by. You're not alone, I'm here for you. Thank you. Dealing with all sorts of procedures and funeral arrangements, there was a mountain of things to do, but sunk in the depths of despair. I couldn't find the strength to move, even though I needed to. The one who acted on my behalf was Andy. I was profoundly grateful to Andy. A month after my mother's passing, I had finally started to find some peace of mind and began to think about the future. Then, the problem that troubled me was the family home my mother had left behind. Hey, about your family home. What about it? How would you feel if we moved into that house? Really? Of course, someone needs to keep living there and take care of it. Otherwise, the yard will become a mess with all the weeds. I enjoy gardening, and I'd rather do it myself than hire someone. I recalled how Annie would regularly visit the family home and eagerly maintain it. That home was filled with so many memories. If he had thought about the family home to this extent, then moving in was certainly an option to consider. That's what I began to think. My mother would have been happy too, with Andy taking care of the house. So, if we're going to live in the family home, would you mind transferring the title to me? I think it would be more convenient that way. Faced with this unexpected suggestion, I was a bit perplexed, but still, I agreed. With Andy's support, I was finally able to move forward again. Life was starting to get back to normal when suddenly... Huh? I thought I'd take a break after finishing a chunk of work, but then my cell phone rang out of the blue. It was the caretaker. I have something very important to discuss with you. When I answered the call, her tone was more serious than usual. So I decided to meet her during my lunch break. Sorry to keep you waiting. No worries, I apologize for the inconvenience. Let's get straight to the point. What the caretaker began to explain was unbelievable. While my mother was asleep, it seemed that Andy, who was taking care of her, was on the phone with someone. The caretaker felt it wasn't right to eavesdrop. But when she did, she found out he was scheming to take over her family home. It can't be. No way. In shock, my farts came to a standstill. Then, the caretaker took out her smartphone. I had a hunch something was off and recorded the conversation. Please listen to this. She said this and pressed the play button. She doesn't have long left. She's probably going to drop dead within a month. It's all good. My wife hasn't got a clue. Ah, uh, just a little longer, just a bit more and that mansion will be mine. Then we can live together, dream of mansion living. Finally I can make my parents proud. The recording was a bit unclear in places, but it was definitely Andy's voice. And then, unbelievable remarks were made. Ah, uh, sure, managing it is tough, but I plan to sell it off after living there a while. I'll sweet talk the wife too. She's useless in the end anyway. Can't even have kids. Certainly. Andy often went to my mother's place alone when I was busy. It was never out of concern for her. The only reason he visited our family home alone was to constantly check on my mother's condition and wait for the chance to take over. I experienced the sensation of everything I had trusted falling apart with a crash. I've been meaning to talk to you about this. But just before I could, the lady passed away and I missed the chance to tell you. It feels too late now. I am truly sorry. With that, the caretaker apologized sincerely. I thought of her struggles. She must have been unsure of what to do and worried about it for a long time. To think that this was going on. I am the one who should apologize for causing you trouble. Please, raise your head. You've done nothing wrong. Right after that, the caretaker said, That's right. As if she remembered something. Before she passed away, she entrusted me with this to pass on to you. What was pulled out of the back was a letter. I quickly opened it as soon as I received it. Therein was a distressing message from my mother. Receiving such a letter so suddenly must have confused you. I can hardly believe it myself. We have both been deceived. Your husband is a demon wearing the face of a good man. Pretending to be kind, he intends to take everything this house, the wealth, everything. You can't trust him anymore. I eagerly read on through the letter. I can no longer trust him. I'm sure, being you, you would want to take good care of this home. 
It makes sense, since it's filled with family memories, but you should do as you please with the house, the memories won't change, no matter what happens to it. I'm always thinking of you. By the time I finished reading the letter, tears were overflowing from my eyes. The caretaker gently held my hand in such a moment. The lady, having realized his schemes, naturally couldn't trust him anymore, so she refused him coming to the house many times. But despite how politely she declined, he would show up almost uninvited. I didn't know what to do either, but just when I thought to consult with you, ma'am, such a tragedy happened. I can't believe my mother went through all that suffering without me knowing. Why couldn't I notice how she was feeling? How did I miss Indy's scheming? Regrets are overwhelming me. No matter how much I try to wipe them away, the tears won't stop. But forgiving Andy for putting my mother and the caretaker through so much is out of the question. That's why I've decided to take revenge. Weeks later, while I was at work, I suddenly got a message from Andy. He said he wanted to talk about something to do with our family home. Talk about what? About your family home, you know? We agreed to meet during lunch, but Andy seemed to be in a hurry. What's going on with my parents' house? I just saw it seems to be on the market. What's that about? It's exactly what it sounds like. I sold the family home. At that, Andy, who could no longer maintain his composure, revealed his true colors. What? Why would you do something like that without consulting me? That's messed up. I'm not joking around. Do you even realize who you have to thank for the life you're living now? After your mother passed away and you were down, I was the one who supported you. Are you repaying kindness with ingratitude? A few weeks ago, I was grateful to you and I trusted you. But now, all I have for you is distrust. Please, let's get a divorce. I told him clearly, but Andy didn't back down. If you want a divorce, fine. I don't mind. Then he laughed derisively, arms crossed. The kind and approachable Andy was no longer there. It's tragic, I think to myself. What was our marriage all about? As pessimistic thoughts flood in, I remember the letter from my mother and rally myself. Can you really say that? Even after hearing this, do you still think you stand a chance against me? With that, I play the audio file that the caretaker had recorded. Then, Andy's eyes start darting around, seeking stillness amidst the chaos. Noticing the unusual tension between us, the onlookers who had kept their distance were now, unbeknownst to us, slowly gathering. Hey, stop it. It's no use stopping. Everyone in the company already knows about this. This voice message has been sent to all employees via company email. As I say this, Andy turns pale and begins to tremble. Well, that's that then. Wait, can't we talk this over? I attempt to leave, but Andy, undeterred, grabs my arm. His nails dig into my skin, and it hurts. Stop it. Let go. Enough already. The shout rang out just then. I could see the CEO heading her way, apparently having heard the commotion. Let go of your wife's arm, right now. Following that, Annie finally released me. Are you okay? Yes, thank you. But why are you here? The employees told me there was quite a commotion, so I rushed over. At that moment, Andy tried to interject. CEO, this is a marital issue. Do you demean people at home as well? But the CEO was unflustered. What are you talking about? You think I'm unaware. Before we knew it, the atmosphere had frozen over. I had been hearing a lot of complaints about you, from the people in your department. It seems you've been doing whatever you pleased, huh? I've heard about how you'd casually blame mistakes on others, hurl insults at your juniors, and look down on female employees without a second thought. There are plenty more stories I've heard about. You really did some unacceptable things. I was shocked to learn about the numerous wrongdoings that Andy had accumulated, and I loaded myself for not having the sensitivity to see his true nature. I couldn't believe that this was all happening at the company. I'm sorry, but there is a reason for this. Excuses at this point. It's more than enough. We have witnesses and evidence. Just admit it. When the CEO said, For now, return to your department. Andy walked away, head down, as if escaping the stairs around him. You've been through a lot, haven't you? It's okay now. Thank you so much. I grabbed the hand that the CEO extended and stood up, albeit unsteadily. Don't worry. 
I've got a fitting punishment in mind for that guy. Afterwards, Andy was relegated to a complete dead-end job. He became an outsider within the company. Having originally been in a prestigious department, it was quite the fall from grace. But this was all his own doing. A literal case of reaping what he sowed. And Andy, unable to tolerate this treatment any longer, resigned on his own accord. Now, how, where he is and what he's doing is anyone's guess. Having had a tumultuous marriage, I quit the bank, sold my family home, and settled into an easy life. I had thought I never wanted to marry again, but I was strangely connected with a man from a company client and remarried. I also managed to fulfill my wish of having a child. I was someone who had despaired of life, but it seems like life has accepted everything about me from now on. I want to live happily with my new husband and our child. Mom, please watch over me. Standing before my mother's grave, with my new husband and child by my side, I began to walk towards a new life. One day, my sister and her husband died in a car accident. I took in their daughter, who was left alone. Amidst all this, I collapsed from overwork. The doctor, knowing what was happening, made a suggestion. Does God really exist? If so, why does he keep taking away the people I cherish over and over? Thank goodness. Are you awake now? I'm Mary Anderson. Having graduated with a liberal arts degree, I now work at the city hall. My parents died when I was young, leaving my sister Alice and me. Alice was always the more put together one bright, glamorous, surrounded by friends. Mary, you're beautiful. It's a waste not to doll up more. Alice would often say that her pouting when she said it was endearing. Thanks, Alice. Look, Amy is calling you. A tranquil, peaceful Saturday. I was at the park with Alice and her daughter, Amy. Amy, what are you doing? Didn't mom tell you not to touch that just now? Curious Amy was interested in everything, and Alice always seemed flustered, rushing over to her. Eventually, both Alice and Amy were covered in sand, and there I was, smiling at the two from a distance. Alice used to work at a restaurant where she met her husband. On Saturdays when her husband is at work, the three of us come to the park like this. Hey, Mary, can you make it to Amy's birthday party next Saturday? Of course. Great. Amy's looking forward to you being there. But are you sure it's okay to give up your day off? Don't worry about it. Amy's smile is all the rest I need. Ah, uh, if you had a date, you should prioritize that, you know. Alice tees with a sly grin. Unfortunately, no such plans. Then, actually, there's someone I want you to meet. Huh? I was taken aback by her unexpected remark. Mary, come over here. Called by Amy. I approached where she was. These heartwarming moments. I always thought they would last forever. The happiness shattered in an instant, the day before Amy's birthday. Why has this happened? As usual, I was at work when I received the call and rushed to the hospital. In the room was Alice, already cold, and her husband, Henry. The cause of death was. The doctor's words didn't register in my ears. The harsh reality hit me. Amy's parents were no longer in this world. Alice and Henry had been out buying birthday gifts for Amy and, next month, for me. The police said their car was hit by a drunk driver on the way back. Mary. Amy's voice brought me back to reality. She sat, curled up in a corner of the room. Mom and Dad won't wake up. I call them but they won't wake up. Why? Her face was ashen, expressing uncertainty. I couldn't find the words to reply. I just held Amy tightly. Alice and Henry's funeral was a small family affair. The family was shocked by the early departure of such a young couple and struggled accepting the reality. Like Alice, Henry had lost his parents early in life. With no siblings, I was his closest kin. When it came time to discuss Amy's future, I immediately offered to take her in. It looked like the family had been awaiting my offer, showing visible relief when I spoke. Having lost my parents early on. So I understand. A child Amy's age is bound to be sensitive to many things. Thankfully, there was no dispute, and the matter was settled without issue. Amy, Mom and Dad have gone to a place that's a bit far away. But they will always be watching over you. From now on, I'll be here with you. Dressed in black, Amy clutched the teddy bear Alice had given her last year. I understand. She said, looking straight into my eyes. Later on, I received their personal effects from the police. In their car were the birthday clothes intended for Amy. And for me, 
a necklace from a famous brand, I, who hardly ever wear jewelry, was almost moved to tears by such a fancy and feminine necklace. You're so beautiful. It will definitely suit you. Come on, try it on. I could almost hear Alice saying that. After Amy went to bed, for the first time since they passed away, I cried out loud. Once started, the tears were hard to stop. Life with Amy began a bit awkward, but because she already liked me, she started smile more often. Amy was so intelligent and easy to care for. Yet, the sudden loss of her parents must have been too much for her. There were nights when she would suddenly start crying. All I could do was hold her as she grieved. She had to change preschools, facing a significant shift in her environment, which must have made her feel very insecure. But Amy was trying hard to adjust. Seeing her effort, I resolved to provide the stable support she needed. My worry was that I had neither marriage or parenting experience, and balancing work while looking after a child turned out to be more challenging than I had imagined. I talked to my boss about my situations, and he recommended reducing my working hours. However, the current staff shortage at my job was severe. I didn't want to cause more trouble, so I declined the offer for reduced hours. As usual, I picked up Amy from daycare, and we held hands on our way home. Amy, what do you want to eat today? Um, hamburgers. Great choice. Let's pick up some groceries and head back, okay? Yeah. Just seeing Amy's happy face made all the tiredness from work go away. I hadn't fully recovered from the loss of Alice, but Amy's presence had become a pillar for my spirit. Still, it seemed the adjustment to her new life without her parents was harder than expected. A few months after starting to live with Amy, one day at work, a colleague expressed concern. Mary, are you okay? You look pale. Oh, really? I'm fine. Probably just a lack of sleep. I said this and turned back to my computer, but I couldn't seem to concentrate today, and I've had a headache since this morning. Maybe you should go to the doctor. It's all right. I'll just take breaks as I need. Thanks, though. We're in the midst of the busiest season. I can't afford to stop working just because I'm not feeling well. I managed to finish my work by quitting time and went to pick up Amy. As I walked to the daycare, my steps felt unusually heavy and unsteady. Even the teachers at the daycare seemed worried about me. Maybe I'll visit the doctor this weekend if I still feel off. I fought this to myself as I walked the usual path home. Mary, Amy played on the slide today. Amy shared her day's events at the daycare. As we walked, the crosswalk near her home came into view. Finally, as I approached home, feeling heavy, I looked ahead and saw a truck coming toward us. Amy, watch out. In a panic, I instinctively pulled Amy's hand. With that force, Amy fell behind me. Mary, what happened? There was a truck just now. Amy's voice was filled with worry. I looked around. Indeed, the truck had stopped safely at its intended position. Did I misjudge the situation? People around us looked confused by my seemingly strange behavior. As I stood there, my headache intensified. The scenery around me started to blur. Mary, are you okay? Amy's concerned voice began to fade away, and I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was lying in a hospital bed. Thank goodness. Are you awake now? I heard a woman's voice and tried to sit up, but a severe pain shot through my head, and I fell back onto the bed. I'll get the doctor. Please lie down, said a woman who seemed to be a nurse, as she left the room. Looking at the clock, it was already past 10 p.m. I must have been asleep for about four hours, since I left the daycare around 6 p.m. Glancing down at my feet, there was Amy, perhaps exhausted from crying, she had fallen asleep. Tears had left their trails on her face. Amy. I'm sorry. This must have scared you. Whispering this, I was overwhelmed with guilt. Excuse me. A male voice sounded, and a doctor entered the room. He appeared to be around my age. A young doctor. I tried to get up, but my head felt so heavy that I just gave up. You're okay to stay lying down. The doctor said kindly, so I stayed lying down and listened to him speak. Miss Anderson, it seems to be exhaustion. You also have a high fever, which I believe is the cause. I don't think we need any detailed examinations. You're still on an four drip, so you could stay overnight. Would you prefer to go home? The doctor's eyes seemed to beg me not to overexert myself. As I pondered what to do next, Amy stirred slightly. It seemed she had woken up. Amy? Did I wake you? Mary. She called my name in a sleepy voice. 
but upon seeing my face, Amy seemed to relax a bit. Amy, I'm sorry. You got scared, didn't you? I'm okay now. To be honest, I still felt quite foggy and my head was heavy, but I wanted to reassure Amy, so I told her that I was okay. Really? That's a relief. Amy said and hugged me tight. I felt a pang of guilt for worrying her. Just then, Could it be, is that Amy? The doctor suddenly said, recognizing Amy. At the sound of his voice, Amy looked intently at the doctor's face. Ah, Ethan. Eh. Afterward, from what I gathered from Amy and Dr. Ethan Anderson, it turns out he lived next door to Amy's family in their apartment building. The hospital I was brought to was near that apartment, and Dr. Anderson works here. Amy always greeted me with such energy. Alice and Henry were always so kind to me. Hearing about Alice and Henry from Dr. Anderson made me tear up. By that time, Amy had fallen asleep next to me again. I explained my current situation to Dr. Anderson. I had no idea. I was wondering what had happened when they suddenly moved. I didn't realize they were going through all that. Dr. Anderson said, looking saddened. In the end, I stayed in the hospital for just one day and decided to be discharged the next day. Dr. Anderson, worried about my well-being, strongly suggested it. Watching Amy sleep on the bed Dr. Anderson had set up, I whispered, Sorry for worrying you, Amy. I renewed my promise not to cause Amy any more worry. No matter what happens, I will protect Amy. The next morning, when I called my workplace, they told me to take some time off. Gratefully accepting my boss's kindness, I took a week's leave. With the fever gone and the headache getting better, I completed the discharge procedures and decided to spend a quiet day with Amy. The following day after discharge was the field trip Amy had been looking forward to. I handed her the packed lunch and saw her off as usual. It's been a while since I've had some time to myself. I don't have the energy to go anywhere since I'm just getting over an illness. But being alone at home, overwhelmed with sadness and getting lost in my farts, so I decided to go for a walk for a change of scenery. Maybe I'll go to that park I used to visit with Alice. It's different from the usual Saturday afternoons I was here. It's quiet on a weekday at this hour. Not many children around. I sat on a bench and gazed up at the sky. Being here, I inevitably think of Alice. It feels like I could hear her happy voice at any moment and tears start to fall. I came out for a change of scenery, but this seems pointless. As I thought this and decided to go back home, someone called out, Mary. A familiar voice was calling me. I turned around and there was Ethan standing in casual clothes. This park is a frequent stop for me. It's close to home. Oh, I'm sorry for startling you. Did I bother you? No, not at all. Just surprised, that's all. When I said that, Ethan replied with it. That's good. Seeming quite happy and took a seat next to me. Do you come here often? Yes, I used to come here a lot. With Alice. From there, we talked about Alice and her family. Thanks to Ethan's familiarity with them, the conversation flowed smoothly, and we shared memories of Alice, laughing as we reminisced. This might be the first time I've been able to talk about Alice since she passed away. Before I realized it, I was also talking about myself. Although we hardly knew each other, I felt at ease talking with Ethan. It was a strange feeling, but somehow comforting. Oh, sorry. I've been doing all the talking. No, it's okay. Actually, I'm glad. Ethan said, looking at me earnestly. I'm really glad I met you here today, Mary. Actually. He smiled slightly before continuing with a somewhat nervous tone. If it's okay with you, could I also support Amy? What? Surprised. I found myself looking away. Only if it's okay with you. I don't want to bother you. You can absolutely say no. But I've received so much from Alice and I really want Amy to be happy so I'd like to help if I can. Ethan's words conveyed just how much he cherished Alice and the others. Hearing his words, I felt truly touched, but it wasn't something I could decide on my own. The most important thing was Amy's feelings. I told Ethan that I needed to confirm with her, and we only exchanged contact information. How about next Saturday? If it's okay with you, the three of us could play in the park. Ethan suggested with a smile, and I felt grateful that he respected our feelings. That day, I just told him we would be in touch and we parted ways there. When I got home, I talked to Amy about today. Amy, do you want to play in the park with Ethan next Saturday? Really? Amy is so happy. 
Amy's face lit up with a smile, genuinely pleased, nodding eagerly. And then the promised day arrived. As soon as we got to the park and Amy spotted Ethan, she ran straight to him. I followed her and greeted Ethan. Thank you for today. We appreciate it. Not at all. I'm looking forward to it. Amy was truly having a great time that day. She enjoyed active play that she doesn't usually get to do while having fun with Ethan. Watching them, I felt sure they must have had fun like this before. Ethan has always been a gentleman since we first met. We continued to play in the park on our days off, but Ethan never came over to our house. Sometimes we would go out or have picnics, and he always made sure Amy and I were having a good time, treating us with kindness. Naturally, I found myself being drawn to Ethan. As our bond deepened, one day we went to an amusement park and later had dinner at my house for the first time. Hey, Ethan. Why don't you stay over tonight? Amy suddenly suggested after dinner. I panicked and quickly said, Amy, don't say things like that suddenly. You're making it difficult for Ethan. But I had so much fun. Since he came to our house, can't we all sleep together? Amy looked a bit for Lauren. Amy. Ethan spoke to her gently. Do you like Mary a lot? Yes. I love her. Well, I really love Mary too. Eh. Excluding me from their conversation, they continued to talk. So you see, I'd be sad if I stayed over suddenly and Mary didn't like it. So I'll go home today. But next time, if Mary says okay, maybe I could stay over. What do you think? Yes. Okay. Hearing this conversation, I think I blushed crimson. I was so embarrassed, I turned my face away. If Mary says, okay, Ethan, will you always be good friends with Amy and me? Amy's innocent words made me unable to hide my embarrassment, and I blushed even more. Then Ethan stood up and came over to me. I want to be good friends forever. What about you, Mary? Will you be friends with me? Yes, yes, I will. I replied with all the effort I could muster. Watching us, Amy was beaming with joy. After that, Amy surprised me. It turned out that Alice had planned to introduce Ethan to me. The person Alice wanted to introduce to me was him. Watching my astonished reaction, Amy said, It was fate, Mary and Ethan. Amy's mature words somehow reminded me of Alice. But I believe meeting him was fate guided by Alice. The sorrow of losing Alice and the others will never be forgotten. However, I want to face forward and protect Amy's smile. I believe that will surely be a tribute to them. Someday, in the distant future when I meet Alice again, I hope to share Amy's happiness, continuing to protect her with a thin.